Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to probably start. Seems like <laughs> everyone's online. <laughs> okay. Hello, hello, hello. So, hi everyone, um, thanks for <laughs> attending the, the talk this morning, or well, afternoon. Um, so, just a, a quick note, um, probably during the, the talk I'll, I'll be using I and me and team and we interchangeably, uh, because I'm, I'm part of the, I think the smallest team currently at Sreo, um, as I'm a, a, a team of one. Um, so just a quick history, um, Fish, well, originally, uh, we were part of the SDP team, um, and doing their, specifically their hardware. And, um, uh, yeah, six months ago, we basically got split off into our own group. Um, and we fell under the CI team. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna give a quick overview of the different locations, uh, just for those who, who don't necessarily or haven't necessarily worked in all of them. Um, so the, the ones that are to an extent under, under my purview, um, you will see the uh, KDRA, K, KABB. Um, I specifically look after the um, SDP racks, which are the row C. Um, from there, obviously, the CI network team look after the high-speed link. Then inside of the CSIR, <coughs> we've got um, uh, our storage and some front ends for external customers, uh, like science users, an idea. And then inside of BRP, we I assist with um, some of the test test systems, uh, some, some operations, operators, and then some business functions. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Again, this is kind of the main signal path. I won't go too much in depth, but effectively on this line, everything to the right, that's kind of what I look after. Um, so obviously from CBF, um, we grab the data, goes through the ingest and calibration process. It then goes to imaging sometimes. And from there it goes to our uh, science archive controllers, our VIS store. And then ultimately it goes to the CHPC um, where our external customers can then actually get the data from. So this is kind of a, <clears throat> a better view of that. So I don't know if the camera is going to be able to see me. I'm just if I point. Um, so basically, the data comes from the correlators and, and CBF. It gets grabbed by the ingest. Where give me for second for my notes. Uh, we do type conversions. Um, averaging of the data and initial flagging of data. Um, this then gets stored in our local buffer, SSD buffer. Um, and I'll talk about more about the, the two types of buffers a little later. Directly it goes into our hot buffer. It then goes to calibration where the data is flagged for, for in-depth analysis, if I understand correctly. Um, and then cal report gets generated which then gets put onto our storage. Um, the guys from CBF, uh, Tyrone's team, will talk a little bit more in depth about the specifics of the software. Um, this data then, depending on what type of sciences or the science uh, team's requests, it goes to our imaging systems where we can do um, spectral and continuum imaging um, using the hardware that we've got available there. Um, all of this 
also, sorry, on that, we specifically have a separate stream um, for what we call QA. It's the, the BF systems. Um, so the idea behind the BF systems is that uh, if we want to create a new dish or get a new dish online, we've got a, a condensed version of STP where the um, site operators can then test the new dishes that need to come online and test that the signal integrity is, is okay. So as I said before, all our data goes to what we call our link outer protection or LOP, which is a hard drive based. This gets pushed to the archive data store um, in CHBC um, when the high speed network from, from the KDRA to CHBC is available. And this data gets stored generally for about 200 days on drive um, and then gets pushed to tape. Uh, and then using the archive, um, archive.cat.ac.za, uh, we then present this data to our external customers. Any specific questions at the moment? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so as I said earlier, we've got our disk data buffer, which is Ceph based. On the Ceph, we've got two different types, what we call our cold buffer and our hot buffer. Hot buffer obviously being SSD, uh, cold buffer is hard drive based. Um, so um, the SSD and why we call it hot buffer is this is technically used for local. So whenever we need to do calibration, we need to do uh, imaging spectral and continuum, we use the SSD to present this data to the local machines because it's a lot quicker and generally it's a lot, a lot of data that needs to be worked on. Um, this is around about 480 terabytes of storage. And then for our cold buffer, uh, which is hard drive based, it's approximately two petabytes. So as you guys might know, that link from site can sometimes be a bit flaky. Um, so in those cases where the link goes down, we need to be able to have a local buffer for that data to get stored until the, the link is back up. Um, so once the link is back up, we, the system automatically picks it up and via S3 data movers, it will transfer it to the CircuIT C3 and hopefully soon C5. Um, so again, just a quick background. Um, the current system is roughly 22 petabytes for raw data storage. Our next generation is at the moment about 9.5 petabytes of storage. This is uh, one of our future projects, um, but it gets stored onto, onto that SEF storage, which is then presented via the archive to our customers. Um, okay, so yeah, we have, sorry, just gonna quickly check my notes. Ah, um, so this is in the KRA, our storage or part of our storage. So this specific rack has got some of our, um, sorry, three of our uh, hard drive storage nodes. And uh, like, these are 48 drive times eight terabyte drive storage nodes. No, I'll come to the, the note about the uh, smaller storage a little bit later on. Um, just give me a sec. <laughs> um, so the high speed storage, sorry, like high speed storage, the, the link out of protection basically runs on these nodes. Um, they, oh, like I said, is 48 times eight terabytes drives. They have attached to them local nodes that effectively do the actual transfer, transfers. And we call these the file writers. And then not in this picture, but on the rack right next to it is our SSD storage, which 
runs or lives on our imaging or imager systems. So these are 20, 20 drive boxes, uh, 20 times one terabyte um, SSD drives. Um, okay, so for that, just out of curiosity, we also run our own network. So it's not part of the current CI networking team's purview. We do have our own networking equipment in the CH uh, in KDRA. Um, so 100 gigab uh, 40 gigabits per second for the interest nodes because the data coming from Inja from calibration or CVF is quite high. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got 25 gig network for the interconnect between the drives so that obviously the machines can talk to each other and trans or make sure that the data stays intact. Um, okay, so what you were just asking. So the current system is 21 petabytes. 21, uh, so 21 petabytes raw. Um, it is, uh, we, we store it in what we call a, a three node um, storage. So every piece of data gets stored on three drives in three separate systems in three separate racks. So that if we lose a rack, we can have redundancy and the data can survive uh, a full rack outage. So that basically gives us seven petabytes raw. Oh, sorry, not raw, seven petabytes usable. Um, these systems are based on parallel par parallax uh, custom made hardware. Um, there's two different models. Uh, we've got hard drive models. Spinning drives again, 48 times 8 pet uh, terabytes. And we have SSD based versions that got, I think, 20 SSD drives internal. Uh, the, the discrepancy being obviously with SSD and the higher throughput, you kind of need to scale it down a bit. Um, yeah. So the next gen storage is um, based on Supermicro and Dell machines. Um, so as I said, it's about 9.7 petabytes of storage raw, but the difference being that we've gone from three, three level uh, storage to what um, Seth calls erasure coding. So for those who know how RAID works, it is the difference between RAID one mirroring and RAID five. So effectively data gets stored across multiple drives with uh, parity uh, stored on another one. Um, the reason obviously we went for this is the advancements that Ceph has done seems to be good. It's a good trade-off between space loss, space wastage and redundancy um, and then speed as well. Um, so the, again, it's a combination of uh, hard drives on the super micros and SSDs on the Dells. The Dells basically being a front end cache and the super micros being the bulk store. Um, so we've got the RBM tape library, which I've got a photo of, not this specific one, but the photo of a little bit later on. So the raw capacity of, Okay, so the IBM type libraries, <coughs> I have a suspicion this is wrong. Um, so the, although it says 21 petabytes, kind of for now ignore this. <laughs> um, the, the IBM type library that we have currently is, um, has got 12 drives. Um, and when I say drives, it is obviously the actual machine that loads these tapes. These tapes can, uh, LTO sevens can store uh, eight terabytes each. And the LTO nine, um, so we've got six LTO nine drives in there. They can store 18 terabytes each. And 
in that type library, we've got 3,370 type plots uh, licensed anyway. Um, so what happens is all of our data gets stored on the highest, on the disk storage so that users can quickly access it. Um, we store this for approximately uh, 200 days. During those 200 days, we start making a copy to uh, the tape drive. Um, and that tape drive, that copy is going to be our long term storage. But we also make a second copy onto a tape that then gets removed. So uh, this would be one of the, them. Um, so the idea being that that offsite copy is there in case of um, absolute mayhem, us losing the CHPC, um, we can then at least recover the, uh, the data from, from our offsite storage facilities. Now, <clears throat> currently the offsite facility storage is in the BRP, but we are currently migrating to, or looking at going to uh, an external provider. Okay, so in the BRP, um, I also run a few systems. Um, so we've got a, yes, sorry. Um, so the usable capacity of the next gen is six petabytes. Um, so, sorry, let me quickly just backtrack here. So just a quick, overview of why we're moving to this. Why is it not going there? Okay. Um, on this storage, you will see that there are nine total racks. So seven of these racks are currently being used by the old story C3 storage. Um, this first rack is our external systems. So that would be cat archive, it is uh, Mattermost, and it is the interface that our users have with our systems. Rack two is this new system, uh, C5. So this is the start of the ultimate project. So the idea would be that um, this six, six petabyte raw, uh, usable storage would um, just be our kickoff block. Once we have migrated all the data to it, the racks from, from three to, to nine would be removed. And we can then start populating rack three to nine one day with the same type of systems. So that would effectively mean that the three racks would supplant the seven racks that we're currently using. Um, and then from there onwards, uh, we've got extra space available for when we go to Meerkat Plus, and if need be for SKA. Um, so in the BRP, we've got a few systems. Um, so specifically, we've got a Proxbox cluster um, where we run some VMs for uh, dev VMs for archive testing. So a lot of times when there's new features that we want to use on the archive, obviously it needs to get tested before we roll it out to production. So we've got VMs for that. We've got a few um, VMs for some of the developers from CAM. Um, we've got a, one or two VMs for RFI team. Sorry, receivers team, not RFI. Um, and all of this is backed by a, a very small compared to the rest. Um, safe storage in, in the upstairs uh, server room. And then in the downstairs server room, we currently have a, a lab slash staging area running that is a combination between SDP and CBF. Um, so the idea is that um, when CBF goes to their um, GPU-based uh, systems, it is not it is tested with 
the new systems from for STP. Um, two interest and two calibration points running. So they're all connected to the same cluster. And we have the ability to test the whole pipeline. So data coming in from CBF right through um, STP and out and making sure that everything is working fine. So that when we do go to production with Miracle Plus one day, um, that the systems are at least tested to an extent. Okay, so as I said before, these storage pods that we've got, um, they were designed in-house by some of uh, the STP team originally, and then built by Parallax. Um, it is a super micro motherboard with a Xeon CPU, 128 gram, and then 48, uh, eight terabyte drive slots. Um, and that gives us approximately 300 and 80, not a second, 384 terabytes of uh, raw storage. So unfortunately, the problem with these is, as, as I said before, obviously eight terabyte drives are a bit old and <clears throat> these systems also really, really use a lot of power. Um, so our new systems are very interesting system. Um, so it has a total of 60 drives in one chassis, but these 60 drives are shared between two nodes at the back. Um, and the, uh, the two nodes effectively run as two, two disparate systems, but inside of one box with one set of uh, power supplies, network cards, and, and uh, back um, storage backplane. So each of the nodes have got 30 drives, two terabyte drives each, um, and each node has got 192 terab oh, sorry, gigabytes of RAM. Um, it's also on 100 gig network, um, so a little bit quicker than the 40 gig from the sorry 25 gig from the previous systems. So again, just a quick view of the different systems that we have in the KDRA. Um, so as I said before, we've got our three storage machines. So these are also parallax systems. Um, that basically uh, are configured in Ceph. Below, we've got another three parallax systems, but these basically store the data locally. And then once they are ready, they send it down to uh, the CHPC. Next, yes, sorry. Um, so it is approximately 50, Kilowatt hour, well, 50 kilowatts uh, for, for the seven racks. Okay. Um, oh, and the new system, sorry, the new system is not a lot less, it's five kilowatts for the single rack. Um, but if, I mean, if you can go and look, it's 50 for nine or 50 for seven versus five for, for one rack, it does make a difference. Um, Okay, so here we've got our ingest machines. These are all, as you can see, all Dell based. So um, top is the, the ingest, bottom is calibration. Calibration tends to need high amounts of memory, um, whereas ingest are GPU based. So they have got GTX 1080s inside of them. Um, for just doing some of the okay. Sorry, flagging. Okay. 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 Um, and then lastly, we've got what we call the imaging systems. So these are super microsystems with quad GPUs in them. Um, and we use this for 
the spectral imaging and continuum imaging um, for when science users want those products. Um, at the moment, it's not used frequently, but we're hoping that at some point we can start making this uh, a regular occurrence to be using these for, for, for the customers so they can quickly get a view of what they're seeing. Okay, so in no, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, so this is a IBM PS fifty four hundred or forty five hundred. Sorry, so. For those of you who keen eyed amongst you, uh, we'll see that this is in the KBRA. So it is a similar system to the one that we have at the CHPC. Um, the difference being the CHPC one has got uh, three cabinets, whereas this has got five. Um, the use for this one is with external particles um, in Sono. We are looking to store the data of what we call our second copy in the KDRA so that we don't have to move tapes around from site to site, but we've got a second redundant copy externally. Um, so if CHPC burns down, God forbid, then we at least have the, the data still available in the KDRA. Um, this is Part of our future projects uh, that uh, the guards for Tola are still busy with this. So this was just a quick photo of of what the type of area looks like, but also of what we are moving towards. Okay, so <clears throat> we these are some of the technologies we use. So um, we use a product called MOS for deploying of our OSs. Um, so it use, uses DHCP and uh, um, okay, sorry, there's a question of the tape library. Okay, so it is a combination, sorry, for those of you who didn't see, uh, the, the question is, is this a custom solution or is this uh, off the shelf? Okay, so it is a combination of both. Um, so this type library is uh, is an off the shelf solution. It is it was bought from a supplier in the US, but what what we are doing is playing around with some logistics. Um, the IBM type library, you pay for everything. You pay for every single slot, you pay for every single drive. Um, and if you don't pay, even if you have the hardware, it just fails to um, actually see the systems. So Solo was able to go and figure out how the system works. And they effectively um, wrote their own backend hardware for, or oh, sorry, backend software, OS, et cetera, for the tape library. What this allows them to do is now use the whole library without paying the exorbitant fees for IBM. Um, and this is then fronted by what we call their um, cache, caching layer. So the caching layer are just a bunch of uh, machines with fast storage, generally SSDs. Um, so what happens is when, when data gets pushed to them, it looks like a Ceph S3 call. Um, and when you get try to get data back, it looks like a Ceph S3 call. If that data has been moved from the um, caching layer to tape and it's not yet not available anymore, we give a known S3 warning or error saying that you need to come back at a later stage uh, to grab the data. That automatically goes and grabs the data from the tape library for you and puts it back into the caching layer. And as soon as you ask again, it will then present you with the data. 
So as I said, it is, it is the physical hardware is off the shelf, but it's been tinkered with by by Tolo. Um, so does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Cool. Okay, so we, as I said, we basically use uh, canonical mass. So this is machine as a service. It allows us to quickly deploy Windows or Ubuntu or uh, I think there's one or two other OSs that it allows you to deploy using DHCP and uh, what they call PXE, uh, pre, -execu pre execution environment. Um, and obviously, we specifically use it to deploy Ubuntu for us. This Ubuntu is then uh, configured using Ansible. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a few Ansible roles and uh, scripts to to put up the the different systems system types for us. So be that ingest or calibration or imaging. Um, all of this is monitored and uh, viewed by way of uh, Elk stack, uh, Grafana, and Prometheus. Uh, so obviously we use those combination of those to do the monitoring, but also to gather trends. Um, the data pathway, so basically making sure that the data moves from one side to the next, we use Apache Solar. Um, so this is, well, Apache Solar slash Nomad. Um, so Solar is used as the backend for it. Uh, so we store where, where the data is in its path uh, or it's in a path time. Um, then uh, Proxbox, Proxbox for those who don't know, it is a virtual machine uh, host, uh, very much like VMware. So we use this to host all those ancillary services that generally tend to be uh, small enough so that we don't reuse a full machine. So as an example, our archive, um, the master controller, so for our clusters, um, the master controllers would run there, our um, solar database runs there, Mattermost um, for, for those who use Mattermost. Um, and then obviously Python everywhere. Um, if you don't know Python, you probably will struggle in, in Unix and Linux. Uh, have we? No, we've never lost any critical data. We've lost many drives. Um, and if you look at this chassis, that's part of the, one of the problems that we have. Um, so if you look at this chassis specifically, this is covered by a big metal plate. So to replace a hard drive in here is quite difficult. You need to effectively remove the whole, uh, the whole server from a rack, which is scary because these are very heavy machines. Um, so you need to remove the whole server. You then need to unscrew the, the lid, rip out the drive, replace it with a new one, put it back uh, or screw it back and then put the back system back and then try and get it back into Ceph. So this was very scary. And it's also one of the reasons we replace hard drives very rarely. Even though the drives fail, Ceph can allow for losing of drives. We tend to not try to replace these drives because it is just, just too scary. Um, with the new system, um, obviously being built off the shelf, it is a little bit easier. Um, as you can see here, the, the system effectively just has got a few clips. You pull it out, you can take out a drive, put a new drive back, and the system is back online in a few seconds, well, a few minutes. Um, so it's part of the reason we, we've gone for off the shelf hardware. Um, obviously these things were designed from by many, many, many engineers to make sure that it is user serviceable. Okay. Um, so to date, from at least since I've been here, we haven't had much wood. We haven't had any major failures uh, and we've not, not lost any data. 
Um, it takes some time to get it back. Um, we've, as I said, we we store the data twice. We all data as soon as we get it, we try to store it twice. Um, so, but at least twice. So that's why, as I said before, we use uh, three-way mirroring. Um, the original Ceph. It is the reason we use the tape drives and we use a second tape as well, so that we have ultimate redundancy. Um, but yeah, so as I said, last one, Ceph. So Ceph has been, I think, a godsend. It is, again, for those who know, um, Ceph is RAID. Um, RAID across machines. Um, it is uh, it gives you the ability to build large RAID arrays across uh, as big a cluster as you can can afford. Um, so um, with Ceph, you can also, like I said, set different levels. So obviously, if you just need ultimate speed, you don't care about redundancy. It allows you to do that. Um, it'll give you hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes per second. Um, if you want redundancy, ultimate redundancy, you can go with, with well, effectively three way redundancy. So, piece of data gets stored three times. Uh, or then, what we've now gone for with next level storage, which is error, oh, error erasure coding. Um, and as I said, that's effectively rate five for those, those that know. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Any questions? Okay, so we we tend to keep one copy in the library. Um, so yes, there is a um, future level or a future point at some point. Well, future point where we will not be able to store anymore, but that is still some ways away. Um, we tend to keep, like I said, one copy in the library, one copy comes at the moment to BRP, and then very soon it'll go to um, an external partner. As for the one in the KDRA, that will for now become our what we call our second copy, but probably in the future, at some point, next year or three, it will probably become our first copy, the, the one that we kind of store everything on, and then we would start using the tape drive in the CHPC to... Brian? Well, I see you update the meeting for this afternoon. Okay. Uh, we would effectively use that as a local tape drive um, so that at some point when we run out of space inside of the tape library we would just pull from there take it to the to our uh, document storage and have that then be a third site for our data Okay, so um, it runs on a dedicated network. So in CHPC, um, we've got uh, 25 gigabit network and 100 gigabit, gigabit network. Um, so the next gen system, the uh, C5 system, runs exclusively on 100 gig. The old system, SC3, runs on 25 gig um, with 100 gig interconnects between the switches. Um, at site KDRA, we use a, again, 25 gig network for uh, interconnects between the systems, and it is standard TCP IP based. Um, so, so very fast networking, but standard Ethernet. Does anybody else in the room online have further questions? Nope, I think, oh, sorry. 
you said you lost lots of drives. How many out of the, say, 2,000 drives? Um, we've lost, I think, about 40 drives in total. Um, yeah, it's, the last count that I had was approximately 40 drives um, out of the, the safe cluster. Um, well, specifically the CHBC one. Um, yeah, I, I can't drive no, I do the math out of my head, but it, we've got about, it's about 2,000 2, drives, yes. Um, so it's, it, well, if you think about it, the, those drives have been running 24 seven for the last five odd years. Uh, well, 24 seven bar outages that we've had at the CHPC. Um, yeah. Any more questions? nothing online okay. and it looks like nothing in the room That's going interesting bruce always has questions going i guess you covered everything um thank you so much Hugo. and thanks to all the attendees as always please don't forget to give feedback the surveys will be going out and the videos will take a little bit of time some of them need to be edited there goes wesley with a question Wesley, you have a question. Yes, um, I wanted to ask, do you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to ask for, for, for the drives, do you have a standard sort of uh, expected lifespan where you, uh, where you will um, change them out before failure or do you, do you just wait for failure before changing them out? Okay, so yes, we try to do the five years. Um, so, if I'm not mistaken, these drives are rated for uh, a few billion hours, but I can't remember the number exactly, but it effectively works out to five, five and something years. Uh, so we are at the, the, the brink where we kind of need to start. And that, that's kind of why this process was started about a year, year or something ago. So that's, that's the idea is, is we want to get the storage replaced with the new new systems so that we don't have have to go and rebuild those systems with with new drives okay yeah, thank you okay well then thank you everyone thanks everyone <laughs>